Today we're going to look at a classic type of problem with a bit of a twist. And so we will determine which of these following two integrals is larger and they're aesthetically similar. So we've got the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the x dx or the double integral from 0 to 1 and 0 to 1 of x times y to the power x times y dx dy. And along the way, we're going to use the following change of variables formula for a multiple integral. And that is, if you've got this way of relating the uv variables with the xy variables, like for instance, maybe u is a function of x and y, and v is also a function of x and y, then the double integral in the xy plane is equal to the following double integral in the uv plane, where we've exchanged our x and y's with u's and v's inside of the function, and we've multiplied by this thing called the Jacobian, which is the absolute value of the determinant of this matrix that's made up of these partial derivatives. Okay, so anyway, now that we've got that maybe recalled, let's get started. We're gonna start with this double integral. So let's write that. We've got the integral from 0 to 1 and the integral from 0 to 1 of x times y to the power x times y and then dx dy. So that's as an iterated integral first. But now what we'll do is write this instead of as an iterated integral as a double integral. So this will be the double integral over the unit interval squared. Well, that's essentially what's going on here of x times y to the x times y dA, where we just recognize that dA is happening in the xy plane. Now we're gonna do a bit of a change of variables, and that's like maybe the biggest part of the solution to this problem, and of course I hinted at it over here. So what we'll do is use the change of variables x equals x, so we're not changing the x variable, and we'll take y equal to u over x. And that might seem a little bit weird, but what that really gives us is u is equal to x times y, which kind of makes sense now because this is now the form u to the u, which makes it look like this other single integral. So perhaps that's gonna help us build our relation. Okay, so now let's calculate our Jacobian. So we've got the absolute value of the determinant of this matrix. So we have partial xy, partial uv. Okay, good. So like I said, that's gonna be the absolute value of the determinant of, well, let's see, we need the partial of x with respect to, well, I wrote u down here, but the role of u is really playing, being played by x again. So that was a little bit of a slip up. So I'll put dx, comma u down here. Instead of uv, we're using xu as our new variables. Okay, so the partial of x with respect to x is one. And now here we'll have the partial of y with respect to x in our new variables. So let's see, that's gonna be minus u over x squared. And now we'll need the partial of x with respect to u, which will be zero, and the partial of y with respect to u, which will be one over x. Okay, great. So now taking the determinant of that, we pretty clearly see that it's equal to 1 over x. You might say, well, it's the absolute value of 1 over x. But that being said, since we're on this unit interval squared, it's always positive. So we're okay there. Okay, so that's our Jacobian. Now we need to see what happens to maybe, it's not exactly the bounds of integration, but the region of integration. Okay, so let's maybe start by looking at our x y plane, and in our x y plane, we're clearly in this unit square. And so, I mean, that's kind of by our definition here. Okay, so now what happens if we pass to, well, it's not exactly a u v plane, it, it's an x u plane given like are the new variables that we're using. So that means that we'll still go from zero to one along the x axis because we're reusing that axis. And now let's look at the rest of this. So over here on this maybe right edge, we have x is always equal to one and y varies between zero and one. 
Oh, well that means that here, x is gonna be always equal to one and u will vary from zero to one. So that'll go up here to the point one, one in this plane. Now let's look at the top edge here. So with this top edge, y is always equal to 1, but x is varying between 0 and 1. Oh, but that means that we'll be along the line u equals x, because notice we'll always have y equal to 1, so solving that will get u equal x. Okay, so that'll be like this line right here. Okay, great. And so putting that all together, we have the following triangle. Now we can rewrite this as the double integral over that triangle. So maybe I'll just make a picture of this triangle of, well, it'll be u to the u over x, and then I'll just put dA, and now we're in the x u plane. Okay, nice. But now what we need to do is translate this double integral to an iterated integral. And the trick is to do it in an order that makes the integration simple. And let's write it down and then we'll talk through. So we'll have the integral from 0 to 1 and then the integral from u to 1 of u to the u over x and then we'll have dx du. So that'll be the way to do it most simply. And I think that's pretty clear because we'd like to do an x integral given the fact that we can't really do the integral of u to the u. There's no like closed antiderivative. But now that inner integral is not so hard. We'll get the natural log of x evaluated at one is zero, evaluated at u will be the natural log of u. But since that's the lower bound, that'll pick up a minus sign. So that'll give us, let's see, the integral from zero to one of minus natural log of u times u to the u, and then we'll have du. Okay, good. But now here we're gonna do one of a mathematician's favorite tricks, which is adding the number zero. And in this case, the number zero is of the form one minus one. And let's see, where are we gonna do that? We're gonna do that to this thing that's attached to u to the u. So in other words, the one minus one will be multiplied into the u to the u. Okay, so anyway, let's see what we have. So we'll have the integral from zero to one of u to the u du. So that'll be from this positive one. And then minus the integral from zero to one of one plus the natural log of u times u to the u. So that'll be from that minus one. And notice I just pulled the minus sign out. The natural log is also attached to a minus sign. Okay, good. So now let's maybe bring that up to the top and then we'll finish it off. Okay, so this is where we ended on the last board. So now I'm gonna do a change of variables in both of these cases. So for this first integral, I'm gonna make a very simple change of variables where I just set u equal to x. And so that's just to put it back so it looks exactly like this other integral that we're working with here. And then for this second integral, I'll use maybe the substitution, which is t equals u to the u. And that's actually gonna require a little bit of calculation over here. So let's do that here. Well, if t is equal to u to the u, that means that the natural log of t is equal to u times the natural log of u. Oh, but that means that dt over t is equal to, well, taking the derivative over here, that'll be something like one plus natural log of u du over here. That's just by taking the derivative of both sides. Oh, but now multiplying through by t and using the fact that t is equal to u to the u, we'll have dt, which is equal to one plus natural log of u times u to the u du. So if we make the substitution where t is equal to u to the u, then our whole integrand here is simply dt. Okay, but then we need to figure out what's happening with the bounds of integration. And maybe I won't go through all of the details with this, but notice when u is equal to one, that means that t is equal to one because one to the one is one. But then u equals zero gives us an indeterminate form. We have something of the form zero to the zero. But that means we need to look at the limit as u goes to zero from above. You might say, well, why from above? Well, that's the region of integration that we're in. 
of u to the u and you'll see that you get one and you can do that with a standard logarithmic trick pretty similar to what we did over here and you might want to use L'Hopital's rule. So notice this means that both bounds of integration will give us one. Okay, so now let's rewrite what we have. We have the integral from zero to one of x to the x dx. So that's from this orange change of variables and then minus the integral from one to one of dt. Oh, but what's the integral from one to one of dt? Well, that's simply equal to zero. That's because we're calculating the area under the curve of something between one and one. Well, there's no width to that, so it's zero. Oh, but look at what we got. We have our double integral is in fact equal to our single integral. So that means they are the same. So neither one is larger, they are in fact equal. Okay, so I think maybe there are some classic follow-up questions to this problem. Maybe I'll present those and then we'll be done. So here's some logical follow-up questions. What about the triple integral that also follows this pattern here? So I did the calculation in Mathematica. I didn't do it by hand, but in fact, this is bigger than both of these. It's bigger by about one-tenth. So a nice like exercise would maybe not to show how much bigger it is, but to show that it is in fact bigger than both of these. And then maybe even a more general follow-up question is what about the n-variable version of this? So the four-variable version, which I also ran in Mathematica, is bigger than the three-variable version. So it seems to be increasing at least for a little bit. But then that really brings up maybe the bigger question is what happens as n goes to infinity? And by some numerical experiments, that seems like it might be correct. But that being said, I didn't go too far. So maybe post in the comments if you try any of these and anything interesting comes from these. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.